Thank you, Richard. Next up, we have Licia Wade Daniel, who is going to be talking about her project in the Gulf of Alaska. My name is Lizzie Lee Daniel, and I am a student of the Marine Science Department. Uh, today I will be um, talking about feeding ecology uh, of sportfish from Gulf of Alaska. Alaska is world renowned for having some of the largest, most viable, and best managed fisheries in the world. In 2021, the commercial fisheries in Alaska had a total catch of over 200 million tons of fish, with brown fish in Alaska <coughs> uh, contributing to 82%. In the waters of Alaska, uh, the waters of Alaska are home to a diverse array of ground fish species, 289 ground fish species, including pollock, Pacific cod, sable fish, and along with an assortment of rockfish and flatfish species. Feeding ecology in conjunction with ecological assessments like recruitment and population dynamics can be used to explore ecosystem functions across various species. Food webs can be used to understand how organisms are connected to their environment and help determine how impact help determine how impacts of large scale changes like overfishing and climate change um, affect individuals. Constructing food webs, however, require detailed data regarding specific dietary patterns, prey selection, and trophic level interactions. <clears throat> Some content analysis provide a snapshot of, recent, of a recent diet of organisms, which, in, which can often be identified to species level and quantified, quantified uh, the amount of prey. There are limitations, however, to stomach content analysis, as no data is available when the, stomach con uh, when the guts are empty, and it often underestimates soft body prey and overestimates hard body organisms, or organisms with hard parts, sorry. Carbon and nitrogen stable isotopes, as uh, carbon and steel, sorry, <laughs> carbon and nitrogen stable isotopes, however, can um, overcome these biases of gut content uh, analysis as they show an estimate of long-term dietary patterns and reflect trophic levels of feeding. When used in conjunction, these two techniques can provide a more complete picture of both recent and long-term diets. Um, the aim of the study is to examine the gut contents of 10 different sport species from Gulf of Alaska to determine if the diet changes across species, sex, and length of fish, along with utilizing carbon and nitrogen stable isotopes to um, assess long-term dietary changes, trophic level of feeding, compared to stomach, on, stomach contents. Here I just want to orient everyone where this project is taking place as it's not anywhere around here. Samples were collected from Homer, Alaska, which is indicated on the map with a black dot. This is where fishing operations were based out of. The samples were collected throughout, throughout, the, throughout areas of Gulf of Alaska, including the area that turns into Cook Inlet. Uh, fish was donated by two different charter companies, North Country and Fringe Benefits Charter Companies, based out of Homer, Alaska. <coughs> Carcasses were filleted and then laid on a flat surface and measured. And measured. <coughs> Total length of fish was recorded in centimeters. Species and sex were determined in the field and verified by one other observer of the charter company. A small sample of muscle tissue and GI tracts were collected from the fish and frozen for further analysis. In total, I collected 10 different species of ground fish from Gulf of Alaska. These include Pacific halibut, Pacific cod, black rockfish, rock greenling, and link cod along with yellow eye rockfish, quillback rockfish, and three species of salmon, king, silver, and pink. <clears throat> GI tracts were thawed and placed in a glass bowl, and the stomachs were identified and dissected. Total stomach contents were removed and volumetric weight was determined. Stomach contents were then meticulously sorted and each prey item separated and measured volumetrically, with each um, and taxonomically identified as well. Fish muscle tissue samples were dried and ground into a fine powder into a fine powder for analysis. In this talk, however, I will be focusing on stomach contents as uh, stomach contents. Here we have the percentages of each dietary component found in each species of ground fish. For most of these graphs, total content 
will be on the right, male will be in the middle, and female will be on the, or sorry, backwards. Total will be on the left, male will be in the middle, and female will be on the right. <clears throat> Along with the colors of prey, uh, the colors that the prey represent will be the same throughout the talk. Um, in all these specific halibut, crustaceans, and lar crustaceans, large and small fish make up most of the diet. The diet in females, however, are much more diverse um, than men and include several, um, uh, several other invertebrates. Something to note here is that, is that these species have a high level of sexual dimorphism, where males are much smaller than females. Males only get up to about 32 kilograms, while, fe while females can get up as big as 227 kilograms. And because of regulation place, um, regulations placed on limits in the size of, uh, of fish caught, charters tend to lead towards the more larger um, animal, which is predominantly uh, female. This next slide, we're still looking at the Pacific halibut, but is split into three size class groups, three size cap class of small, medium, and large. The small and medium have the, di the most diverse diet with 50% crustacean, and small and large fish make up the most of the rest. The medium-sized fish had over 57% crustaceans, and the rest was full of small and large, fi large fish. However, the large size classes were the only halibut to feed upon cephalopods. Next, we have the Pacific cod, which its diet contained primarily crustaceans and several species of large and small fish. In females, I was able to identify both flatfish and Lupeeds, sorry. <laughs> Although it's difficult when species are un unidentifiable, Pacific cod uh, apparently prey heavily on the combination of crustacean and fish. Here we have the um, result of ling cod that only contain female. This is again uh, due to this high sexual dimorphism that is found within these species as well, where males are smaller than females, and the fishing regulations skew towards the catch and keep of larger um, larger fish, which again are females. This diet consists of large unknown fish, salmonids, and cephalopods. Rock green ling have, the diet, um, have a diet that consists mostly of invertebrates with crustacean and tunicates being the, large, the majority that make it up, along with a very small percentage of unknown, small unknown fish. Males and females have a very similar diet, except males consume, consume that small percentage of fish, while females had no um, had no diet, or had no fish in their diet, sorry. <coughs> Black rockfish only had three things in their gut, clupeeds, crustaceans, and small unknown fish. Males appear to be feeding on a much larger number of crustaceans than females. Uh, for yellow eye rockfish, only male samples were caught. Like black rockfish, they only had a limited variability in their diet, with just three things in their stomachs of crustacean at 51%, cephalopods and large unknown fish making up the other half. I did have one quillback rockfish, but its guts were empty, so I will not be discussing it here, but its tissue samples were sampled, were processed for stable isotopes. Um, uh, silver salmon had clupeeds and other small fish and small amount of crustacean larvae in their diet, although the clupeeds um, were the majority of what was found in males and females, only females have the crustacean larva, larvae in their guts. Pink salmon, by comparison, had pre, uh, fed predominantly on crustacean larvae and showed dimorphism in their diet as males only fed on clupeed fish and females only fed on unknown larval fish. Finally, we have the king salmon, which had the least amount of variability in its diet across all ground fish species and exclusively fed upon fishes with very similar proportions in males and females. Overall, there's a large overlap in diets among the species in of ground fish included in the study. Interestingly, the vast majority of these species utilize similar diets within the ecosystem and therefore utilize different feeding niches to limit competition. Greenling and halibut can be found in the same area of benthic ecosystem, but whereas halibut feed predominantly on crustaceans, greenling feed on a large variety of other invertebrates. Pacific cod was found to have the most diverse diet found in all the species that were studied, indicating they are the most opp opportunistic feeders. Black rockfish had the emptiest stomach among the, among the species studied, six of the 19 that were collected, which is typical as the species has a high rate of regurgitation when caught. Crustacean what, uh, were found in the majority of the diets of these fish. Eight of the nine 
species that guts were examined. This is important to understand because the ground fish are a part of a larger commercial fishery in Alaska that also includes crustaceans. Since both ground fish and crustaceans are heavily fished in Gulf of Alaska, it is important to understand that these species have an inherent link as predator and prey. And what we do on one side of the equation could, could significantly affect the other side of the equation if these species were managed individually. Therefore, monitoring, monitoring of ground fish diets of Gulf of Alaska is a critical part of effective ecosystem-based management strategies. I just want to say a huge thank you to the three captains, Captain Wyatt, Captain Ben, and Captain Christian, along with my thesis advisor, um, Dr. Jason Turner, and my lab assistant, Abigail Lewine. Thank you, any questions? Yes. Great, great talk. Um, just curious, in the gut contents for the crustaceans, did you find oftentimes that you would just find the helipad of the claw, uh, you know, the claw, helipad, that would be another of uh, crabs versus whole bodies? And did you see any taxonomic bias in that? Yes, so for, for the um, results, we kind of kept, uh, I moved it into a certain order so they all stayed on the same line. But um, uh, there are many times I could get down to species level where I can just defer, uh, do the difference of like pygmy crab, dungeness crab, and tanner crab that was found. And then yes, um, I did find where it was just claws or just legs that I was finding, but I considered that as one crab. Gotcha. Yeah, we did a study a number of years back for four species of rockfish that showed that the porcelain crabs that readily atomize their claws to get away, it's got kind of like get out of jail free uh, card. Um, typically in the rockfish stomachs, you would just find the claw, not the rest of the body, presumably mm -hmm. because the crab got away. Yeah. And, yeah. But for the rack and urine crabs, which most of which you just described, you find the whole body because they don't readily atomize because um, they need them for this defense and feeding for the porcelain crabs or primarily suspension theory, but I'm just kind of curious if, if, if you had any insights further, especially with these other species. I will say it was more full body crabs that I found within the guts than just, just claws. Yeah, gotcha. Okay, great, thanks. Any other questions? Yes. You did amazing work. I could tell that it took a long time because of your sample size and all of the meticulousness of piecing those things apart. Yes. Can you describe a little bit more what that process was like? Like, did you have to use a microscope to identify some species? So what was really nice is a lot, um, yeah, there were really, really small ones. Um, but a lot of times, uh, it was a lot of work. Um, and when they came out, um, okay, I used about a dis disc dissecting scope. And um, usually a lot of the stuff that you're seeing, it was actually naked eye availability to see. Um, but yeah, it was very based in the smell of guts <laughs> and uh, forceps going through. <laughs> yes. How do we know that these were just big in the guts? So um, with the knowledge of the fishermen that I was working with, I was able to, um, they were not included. So one thing with bait there is they use herring a lot and herring they cut in half to save productivity. And then another one that I found was, it's called salt, salted herring roe, and it's sliced in the middle. And so that was another bait I found. Um, but I made sure like to see if the whole thing was there and if the whole thing was there and not cut, I considered it not bait. Yeah. I saw that on one of your slides, you had like a whole brittle star in a dish. I just wondering if you pulled like that whole thing out of the fish. Yes, yeah, so um, surprisingly enough, I know the brittle star is really cool. My favorite thing that I pulled out, I pulled out two full octopus, like full on the dish. Um, so a lot of the times I had full crab, I had, again, full octopus, I had full um, uh, fish as well. So a lot of the invertebrates and invertebrates that I found were either really digested or at the full stage. I saw a flyer uh, during the time when you were doing this study and it said Alaskan fish for sale. And I just wanted to verify that that was not you. So. <laughs> that was not me. That's actually very illegal to do because you're not supposed to go and catch a sale somewhere else. So. Just wanted to make sure. <laughs> not me. <coughs> Any more questions? Okay. Thank you guys.